everybody for this special seminar. I'm glad everybody made it. For, there's a few who are new, so I just want to say my name is Charles Small, and I'm the director of the Yale Initiative for the Interdisciplinary Study of Antisemitism, and we're based here at ISPS. So today it's uh, an honor to have Graham Davies with us today. Uh, today he's going to speak on the title of this talk is from Philo-Semitic to Anti-Semitic. Shifts in attitude toward sorry shifts in attitude towards the Jewish people among Western European minority community. Uh, Mr. Davies is a poet, editor, and literary critic. He's from Wales. He was brought up in a village near Wexham in the northeast part of Wales. After gaining a degree in English literature from the CCAT, which is now Angl Anglica Ruskin University in Cambridge, he qualified as a journalist at the Thompson Organization and worked on newspapers in South Wales. He, he's a, his career in journalism and TV as a, as a TV producer brought him, an, an, brought him a number of Welsh and UK industrial awards. In 1997, he was awarded a doctorate at the University of Wales for a study written in Welsh of the works of R.S. Thomas and Sondra Lewis, T.S. Eliot, and Simon de Plan, who he identified as part of the an anti modern trend in Western culture in the 20th century. Um, and I know from colleagues internationally uh, in, in Israel and Europe that many people have actually been writing in uh, envious that we have him with us today. And we're actually videotaping it so uh, it can be part of our archives so uh, scholars from around the world can actually uh, see this in a couple of days. So it's really a pleasure that you're here and thank you very much for coming. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction and thank you very much. Cindy for uh, the, the contacts and all the assistance in uh, arranging my visit here. Uh, now, this is the first time I've been to New Haven, the first time to Yale University, but I am actually uh, an alumnus of a different Yale in my hometown, Wrexham, in North Wales, which of course is where NU Yale is buried, where his family came from, where he is buried and the local sixth form college which I attended between 16 and 18 is called Yale Sixth Form College. So when I went to university I had the, the experience of, of referring casually to when I was at Yale and of course, which to somebody from Wrexham means the local sixth form college, not the world famous institution of learning. But I'm very glad to be in what I, I suppose I have to call the real Yale College as you're very much older than my sixth form. So, it's a, a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry it couldn't be a happier subject than uh, anti-Semitism, but there we are. So I'm going to begin this lecture with two quotations. <coughs> Both of them are translated from the Welsh language. Now, here's the first translation. This is from somebody called T. Ap Simon. And he was a cultured, young Welsh speaker serving as a British Army captain and writing for a magazine in October 1917, just after the Third Battle of Gaza, in which Allied forces broke through from Egypt into Palestine. And here's the quote. Is our host, like the host of Joshua, a chosen instrument to redeem the land from its Turkish oppressor? Is perhaps the time drawing near when the old nation will come back again to its land forever? The old godly people of Wales used to sing so often in their missionary prayer meetings, the prophecies will be fulfilled, all the promises will be made complete. And the return of the seed of Abraham to his land was a strong element in their petitions. If we have the privilege of preparing the way for the old nation to return, then we will have done something to be proud of. And remember that young Welsh people are doing their part. He's writing home from the front to a magazine in Wales. Here he is again, a couple of months later, writing in Jerusalem on December the 11th, 1917, the day when, Al when Allied forces entered the Holy City. Everything portends a fine future for the land after the war. The utopia of the prophets will be seen as a fact before long in Palestine. The Hebrew schools are alive, and the Hebrew language is being taught despite the opposition of the atheists and the millionaires. The Jew has proved before the world his ability and his suitability 
to form a national life, hail to him, and may he succeed. Now, this wasn't a simply empty rhetoric. There were thousands and thousands of British soldiers died in that campaign. And that worldview, that, that sense that they were redeeming the Holy Land, which they knew then was given to the Jewish people, was, was common. This wasn't a, an, an eccentric view. This was mainstream. Now, here's the second quotation. Um, this is coming up to the present day now. This is from the main Welsh language internet forum. And this is from a year ago. And this has been written by a cultured young Welsh woman. Jew equals Israeli. Equals the bone of contention. Equals the enemy of the modern Welshman. And the rest of the civilised anti-materialist world. And if you don't understand this simple formula, you may as well go there to live, as long as Israel exists. And that won't be for long, hopefully. And some more. Now, she, other people are on this forum are remonstrating with her and saying, you can't say that kind of thing. She responds. But, and they say, well, you know, other, other nations do things wrong. Why are you taking on the Jewish people? She says, I have reason and evidence against the Jews. And looking carefully at the evidence, they're guilty. Israel's like a rampant cuckoo in the nest, fouling the nest, and claiming it for itself with its little eye for an eye mind, and its beak and its claws in the skulls of little Palestinian children. That is more. Another debater tries to demonstrate with her, she responds, have you been circumcised or what? There's more. This would close any argument, she says. Well done, the Welsh bugger the Jew. This is 2006. This is, and I'm saying this is mainstream discourse, that this is, grow, is growing out of what I suspect is the same um, national views. Now, there were contrary voices. Though that view did not go unchallenged. And the webmaster indeed banned her for those comments. But it's deeply troubling that 90 years after the writing of the first piece I quoted, someone who is a direct inheritor of the values of the same small cultural group could write something so perverse and feel, no doubt, that they were in the same tradition of supporting the underdog. So in this talk, I want to show how one community, the Welsh, who consider themselves, with some justification, much justification historically, to be an oppressed minority, have related to the Jewish people. I think this may provide some insights into the dynamics of philo and anti-Semitism within at least one Western European minority group, and it may open up some wider issues for discussion. Who do I mean by the Welsh? I mean across the small Celtic nation, three million people on England's western border, the first country conquered by England when it was expanding in 1282, and the last to regain some partial independence in 1997. So, Please bear in mind when I'm talking about Welsh attitudes that given seven centuries of English rule in Wales, much Welsh public, public opinion was, and still is, the same as England's. The amount of distinctiveness is actually quite slight. So I'm concentrating on that distinctive element, and that distinctive element is largely confined to the intelligentsia. The intelligentsia, like all intelligentsias, tend to be more radical than the majority. So I wouldn't want you to think that these are widespread attitudes. They are confined to the intelligentsia and a section of that intelligentsia, not the whole of it. So the intelligentsia of which I'm speaking is considerably more nationalistic, more Welsh-speaking, more left-wing than the white population. Now, my own background, I have no Jewish background. I encountered Judaism in the 1990s when I was writing my doctorate on those four writers you mentioned. T.S. Eliot, of course, had a famously anti-Semitic speak, or made some famously anti-Semitic comments. He had a Welsh follower from a distance, Saunders Lewis, who picked up his anti-Semitism along with his other cultural attitudes. Then there was Simone Day, French, Jewish, very likely self-hating. And then I had another voice who was neither Jewish nor anti-Semitic. But I was writing about this and realized that I couldn't write about Judy, about anti-Semitism or Jewish self-hate until I'd encountered Judaism in some form. So I arranged a visit to the local synagogue, and this led to an instant fascination with the Jewish people, with their history, with their religion. And it 
it's led now to three, three trips to Israel, to this, this book, The Chosen People, which is a, uh, a collection of writings about the, well, the dealings of the Welsh and the Jewish people. And this book was called An Example of British Philo-Semitism, and if that's what it is, I'm very glad. Now, I was to look at the philo-Semitic strand and the anti-Semitic strand in the Welsh intelligentsia's response. The philo has historically been the dominant strain. Now, when did the Welsh first encounter the Jewish people? <coughs> well, from as early as the 6th century, there's a long history of the Welsh, like any number of groups who perceive themselves as disenfranchised, aggrandizing and glamorizing their own status by borrowing moral authority from the biblical Israel. Now, this is a process which I think is impertinent, it's understandable, it's impertinent, as it's still, in a way, an implicit compliment to the Jewish people. It's not something I, I encourage, but it happens. The same kind of thing is behind the claim that Joseph of Arimathea came to Wales with the Holy Grail. In the 18th century, was, there was a belief, a very widespread belief in Wales and beyond, that the Welsh and their language were descended from the Jewish people and from Hebrew. They're not. Welsh isn't descended from Hebrew. But this was very widely believed. What was going on? The Welsh wanted status, they wanted to play on the European stage when vernacular cultures were developing, and to do that in those days you needed a, an antecedent, you needed to be of noble descent of some kind, anything would do. There was a strong belief that uh, the Welsh were descended from the Trojans, there's, there's some evidence of that in, in Shakespeare when Henry V, where the Welsh character is, uh, is called a base Trojan, because we're not descended but we wanted to be descended from somebody so we could be more involved. But those, those are fantasy rather than reality. Real contact happened probably in the 12th century during the Crusades. Thousands of Welshmen went on the east and they would have encountered Jewish communities. But I have been through the abundant Welsh medieval literature of the period and I can't find any extensive passages dealing with the Jews. All I can find by use of the index if you look up the word Ither, which means Jew, you look it up in the, tray, it's in the text, it's used as an insult. Not an insult to Jews, but an insult to Gentiles, to whom uh, various characteristics are being attributed. So it's there, this is general Catholic Christian medieval prejudice against the Jews. Wales was clearly not immune from that. 1290, of course, Edward I, who conquered Wales, expelled the Jews from Britain and the opportunity for further real contact didn't arrive until the resettlement under Oliver Cromwell in the 17th century. So it's in this post-Reformation period that we find the familiar contours of Protestants of Wales emerging and the relationship between the Welsh and the Jewish people intensifying. This tended to be, we're thinking of Cromwell, Puritanism, Millenarianism, it tended to take on a sense that the Jewish people needed to be converted to Christianity as a precursor of the Second Coming. And there are many examples of this in Welsh literature, uh, Welsh divines and poets, George Herbert and Henry Vaughan, uh, great mystical thought of as English poets, actually Welsh Vaughan, Henry Vaughan, actually Welsh speaking, 16th and 17th centuries, they shared these ideas. And here's a poem from uh, Vaughan, faith, addressing the Jewish people, Faith, sojourn first on earth in you, you, where the dear and chosen stock, the arm of God, glorious and true, was first revealed to be your rock. You were the eldest child, and when your stony heart despised love, the youngest, even the Gentiles then, were cheered, your jealousy to move. So this is substitutionism across the Christian church being seen as superseding the Jewish people. After the resettlement, there were isolated Jewish individuals in Wales, itinerant traders, some small mercantile communities from the mid-18th century on. But only really in visits to London synagogues did Welsh Christians encounter real Jewish people. One of those, however, gave the English-speaking church the most Jewish of all Christian hymns, the God of Abraham Praise. I don't know if you've ever come across that. It's still some. You'll find this in hymn those of you ever find yourself in a Christian church. Have a look for uh, in, in the index, the God of Abraham praise. It's there in most mainline hymnals. It was written by Thomas Oliver. He was an 18th century Methodist preacher. He was a friend of John Wesley. 
a good enough friend to be buried in the same grave as him. So they obviously uh, were pretty close. He went to the great synagogue in London in 1770, he heard the cantor singing the Yigdal, was impressed with it, translated it into English, or had it translated, I don't know if he spoke either, translated it, paraphrased it, Christianized it, and set it to one of the tunes given to him by the cantor. Uh, first verse, it's a long hymn, ten verses. The God of Abraham prays, who sits enthroned above, ancient of everlasting days, and God of love. Jehovah, great I am, by earth and heaven confess, and thou bless the sacred name, forever blessed. Because he mentions Jesus a couple of times later, he interprets uh, references to Jesus. So this is a pretty sympathetic engagement to the evangelicalism with Judaism. But we're not quite yet at the point where evangelical Protestantism found common cause with Zionism. This is a little before Zionism, of course. We're still talking about conversionism. And Although it was sympathetic, there was also tension. And there's an example, a cause celebre in 1867, which was actually known as the Cardiff Jewess Abduction Case. And this happened when a young woman called Esther Lyons, 18-year-old Jewish woman, had troubles at home, ran away, confided in a Christian friend who passed her on to conversionist Welsh Baptists, who spirited her away out of the country completely, while their father tried to get her back. And the father eventually issued a writ of habeas corpus, you know, this ancient law which compels you to, re to literally have the body to, to release them. A writ of habeas corpus to get him back. And it became a sensational court case. And in which, and this is interesting, public opinion was firmly on the side of the Jewish family. Because they saw that the conversionists had acted deceitfully. And public opinion was firmly on this side. He won the case and uh, got damages from the conversionists. But he didn't get his daughter back because she remained apparently willingly with her. I say apparently because she was never heard from her. But she was spoken to through intermediaries and they, they couldn't get her to come back. So, there was conversionism. But conversionism influenced the would be converted as well. And with quite far reaching consequences. In the mid 19th century, Welsh Calvinistic Methodists sponsored a long term mission by a minister called John Mills to convert the Jewish people in London and Palestine. It might be hard to imagine just how confident Welsh-speaking Calvinistic Methodism must have been to have sponsored a mission to Jewish people in London and Palestine. And he never had any converts at all, not a single one. But he learned Hebrew, he befriended, he, exp he explained Christianity to Jewish people, and he explained Judaism to British people, to Christian people, which wasn't done a great thing. And there's a little quote here from him. Uh, this is all translated from Welsh. He visits Palestine and a rabbi offers a prayer for him. And afterwards, John Mills records, my heart melted in pity for them. They had indeed honored me beyond every, everything. Praying publicly for a Christian minister, it was indeed a new thing on the earth. And I thought and pondered for a while, remembering how our fathers in Wales used to pray warmly for the Jews, and how that has now been almost completely forgotten. And I asked the God of all mercies to restore it to our congregations of every denomination. Oh, how delightful it would be if the Jew were remembered in every service throughout Wales, every Sabbath, every week. Who knows how soon the prayer of the synagogue might come to end, not with Amen, but to Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, so he goes on. Conversionism, yes. Of but it's war. You know, he's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a relationship, an admiration. <coughs> and this is important for later developments because, of course, in Christian thought, the second coming was dependent not just on the conversion of the Jewish people, but dependent on their return to Israel from exile. So, albeit for their own reasons, Welsh Christians had a foundation of identification with the Zionist project when that began. And this affected not just firebrand evangelicals, even nominal Christians, people like George Eliot. Now, she was born Mary Ann Evans. Evans, and if you've seen that, that booklet, which the Welsh government uh, gave me to. Uh, give out at uh, any talks. And you'll see Evans is a, is a Welsh name, and she was a Welsh ancestry. Her father prided himself on the idea that he was of noble Welsh descent. I don't think he was. Uh, his, uh, the village his ancestors came from was called North of Hall. It's the name of, of a village, but I think he thought Hall meant that he was an aristocrat, and consequently he, he fostered these ideas. first thing George Ellis ever wrote was based on this uh, idea of a, 
uh, a very remote ethnic prestige. And of course you go down the Deronda, where somebody who's brought up in one culture discovers that he actually has a prestigious, glamorous ethnic heritage. It's not too far to imagine that her own preoccupation, that her own family's preoccupation with their different roots may have influenced uh, the scenario of Daniel Deronda, which itself, of course, influenced uh, Zionism and the revival of Hebrew. Theodor Herzl came to Cardiff in 1895 to promote his ideals, and he met Colonel Albert Goldschmidt. He was a senior British Army officer, an ardent Zionist, who was bringing up his children Hebrew-speaking in Cardiff in the late 1890s. He'd been born Jew uh, <coughs> Jewish, but brought up a Gentile by adoptive parents, and then he rediscovered his roots and uh, became you know, reconnected with Judaism. He met Theodore Herzl and said, I am Daniel de Ronde as he identified to that image. Let's have a look at Welsh Zionism from the Jewish perspective, because by now, after the pogroms in Eastern Europe, there were Jewish communities, substantial Jewish communities, in the industrial districts of South Wales. <coughs> and we've got here Lily Tobias. She is the maternal aunt of the great Welsh Jewish poet, Danny Absey, who's now in his 80s, and may obey his work. And she was a Welsh-speaking Jewish woman. And she wrote a remarkable collection of short stories about pre-World War I Welsh Zionism. And this was published in a book called The Nationalists. And the cover of The Nationalists actually has the Welsh dragon within a star of David. It was remarkable. It's not good literature at all. But it's, because uh, everything is about Zionism. It? And there's no character development or anything. You know, it's, it's like, you know, they talk about Zionism. You know, should, should, should we go to Palestine? Oh, yes, I think it's the best thing for our people. And then, the next thing is, 20 years later, they met in Jerusalem, and it, it kind of <laughs> jumps on, just, it's only interested in the Zionism and nothing else. But it's fascinating as a historical book. And what we see through this is that Welsh nationalism, evangelicalism, and Zionism are in a kind of benign fusion at this time, as she saw it. Now, this is because the interests of the intelligentsia in Wales were identifying their own national aspirations with those of the still expanding British Empire, which uh, and was seeking to play a junior but important part in that, so they were not in any way hostile to Zionism. So in Tobias's stories, Welsh nationalists are invariably portrayed very sympathetically, and anglicised Welsh people are criticised. Several Welsh characters, particularly religious ones, are shown to be more sensitive to Jewish identity <coughs> and to Zionism than some Jewish people. This next extract, a young a uh, Jewish woman who is actually <coughs> assimilationist, she, she wants to blend in. She meets a Welsh friend's elderly uncle. Um, it begins with an exclamation, Merchan Will, that means uh, dear girl. Merchan Will, he exclaimed in his broad, emphatic accents. And proud I am to meet you for sure. Why I do love the Jews. Indeed I do. You are the people of the book, and the Lord will show his wonders through you yet. You've got a big job in front of you, my girl. And what is that, Mr. Jones? Asked Sarah politely as she recovered her breath. The return to Zion, my girl, said the old man solemnly. Oh, as I could live to see the day. Looking at it from the Welsh perspective, same period, here's a translation from a poet, Cruis, written in 1918, talking about the Jewish hope of return. He says, for nearly 2,000 years, this confidence has burned in his heart, and tempests only fan the flame higher. By today, are there not clear signs that the old dream is almost realized, that the Zionism of recent times has almost succeeded in its desire, and that the sound of the striking of the old wanderer's tents can be heard in the ends of the earth? Until that day dawns, let the Jew take comfort in remembering that it is he who has given the world the surest of all the laws that in the vessel of his language and ancient literature has been transported the treasure of revelation in every age, and thus from his broad loins have come philosophers like Paul and Spinoza and Moses Mendelssohn and poets like David and Heine and musicians like Felix Mendelssohn and philanthropists like Rothschild. If this is not enough, let it be also remembered that a Jew called Jesus is the ruler of the world, and that if every Jew returns to his land, more than seven nations will grasp at his hem, saying, abide with me. So this is quite heated rhetoric, isn't it? There's high expectations. Yeah. But aspirations are one thing, sympathy is another thing. But of course this return couldn't happen without political power. And 
the Welsh connection here is very significant because Wales played, played a key role here because the British Prime Minister during the First World War was Lloyd George, Welsh-speaking Welshman, uh, a nationalist in his early uh, days, brought up on exactly that kind of rhetoric. So when Chaim Weizmann went to him during the war, calling in the favour for the uh, solution he brought to the munitions into the Allied munitions industry, and Churchill said, "What can I do to reward you?" And Chaim Weizmann just said, "Well, we want a chance to uh, have a home for our for our people," and he persuaded Lloyd George to put that idea to the War Cabinet, and the War Cabinet, of course, endorsed it, and the British then backed that up with force and conflict Palestine. Now, here is David Lloyd George putting that into his own words in 1925, talking to the Jewish Historical Society of England, and he's explaining his support to Zionism. This was undoubtedly inspired by natural sympathy, admiration, and also by the fact that we had been trained even more in Hebrew history than in the history of our own country. I was brought up in a school where I was taught far more about the history of the Jews than about the history of my own land. I could tell you all the kings of Israel, but I doubt whether I could have named half a dozen of the kings of, it, of England. I don't know if you read in current affairs currently, but um, Gordon Brown said more or less exactly that very recently. And of course, he's a son of the mouse. He, he echoed that. He wasn't deliberately echoing the large job. He made exactly that same rhetorical point. And not more of the kings of, of Wales. So that you must remember that was very largely the basis of our teaching. On five days a week in the day school, and on Sunday in our Sunday schools, we were thoroughly versed in the history of the Hebrews. We used to recite great passages from the prophets and the Psalms. We were thoroughly imbued with the history of your race in the days of its greatest glory, when it founded that great literature which will echo to the very last days of this old world influencing, molding, fashioning human character, inspiring and sustaining human motive, not only for Jews, but Gentiles as well. We absorbed it and made it part of the best in the Gentile character. So that, therefore, when the question was put to us, we had all that in our minds, so that the appeal came to sympathetic and educated on that question, intelligent hands. But I'm not going to pretend that there was not a certain element of interest in it. To you call yourself a small nation, I belong to a small nation, and I'm proud of the fact it is an ancient race, not as old as yours. And although I'm very proud of it, I'm not going to compare it with yours. One day it may become great, it may perhaps be chosen for great things, but all I know is that up to the present it is small races that have been chosen for great things. And there we were, confronted with your people in every country in the world, very powerful. You may say you have been oppressed and persecuted, that has been your power. You have been hammered into very fine steel. And that is why you can never be broken. Hammered for centuries into the finest steel of any race in the world. And therefore, we wanted your help. The real politician. Now remember, he's talking to a Jewish audience after the event. But there's a, there's a lot of truth in that all the same. <coughs> and you've got political will. But of course, you also need military force. And Lloyd George realized how well the conquest of Palestine and the holy places would play with his core constituency back home in Wales, religious, Bible believing, evangelical Christian. And he made sure that the reinforced British Allied forces in Egypt, which was the British base at the time, were reinforced with as many Welsh troops as they could possibly spare. So that when they had the final campaign in 1917 to conquer Palestine, they could present this as a Welsh victory. And that's exactly what they did. But it cost thousands of lives because the Turks were not in any way a pushover and they weren't going to vacate the places they held for 400 years at the wake of a non-conformist hymn book. But it cost, it was costly. But they were up for it, these soldiers, many of them shared these ideals. So I'll go back to T.F. Simon, who we heard about at the beginning, and he's writing this the day after, the day that Allied forces entered Jerusalem. It is the brotherly love of the Jew, which is the explanation of the success of the colonies, even to the early Zionist colonies. They have a proverb that all Israel is responsible for one another. Under the inspiration of that principle, the rich Jew extends help to the man who is in his debt. The gentleness and the care of that first prophet for the poor and those in danger of dying has come to the surface 4,000 years since the law was laid down. Perhaps this enlightened age has something to learn from Moses yet. I mentioned the entry into Jerusalem, and I'll, this is my one slide. What's that? Now, 
know if you can see it very well. That's a painting by Frank Danguin. It was painted in the... Oh, you can get the lights, thank you. Um, I'll only spend a moment on this. Uh, this was painted in the 1930s as a Welsh war memorial project, and it's called The Entry of the Welsh Troops into Jerusalem. They're going in on December the 11th, 1917. Uh, they're going in on foot because it was the holy city and they weren't going to ride in or go in motor cars or have a gate dismantled like the Kaiser had done earlier to get in. They went in on foot. And that's the Jaffa Gate. Yeah. And um, so that hangs in the National Museum in Cardiff. So I mentioned this for you to see what a big public deal this was. This wasn't some kind of fringe interest of religion. This was total mainstream Welsh public thing. I've been to the, uh, the newspapers at the time, I looked at the, micro, the microfilm and the Western Mail at the time, the local newspaper, uh, rejoicing in Jewry, is what it said, when Jerusalem was, was captured. Enemy driven back by Welsh troops. This is the thing, this was seen as a Welsh country. So that's, if you like, the high points of Welsh fine Welsh semitism. And it seems a long while ago, a different world that could produce such a Bible based response to current affairs. But it's, it had an aftermath as well. We had the mandate period, of course, and even up to the time when there was the vote on the establishment on the partition of Palestine, we, we can find the strain of Welsh evangelical uh, belief still flowing, not as strongly, but where it was flowing, it was flowing, it was flowing strong. And here we have Rhys Howell, a Welsh evangelical Christian who had an extraordinary intercessory gift, and he's praying for. Uh, the United Nations to create the Jewish state. And he said, we pleaded that because of his covenant with Abraham 4,000 years ago, God would take his people back to their land and Palestine should again become a Jewish state. And when it did happen, he said that was one of the greatest days of the Holy Ghost in the history of these 2,000 years. So we're into the post-Second World War period now. And after that period, this philo semitism still running strong, Post-war secular Welsh nationalism took inspiration from the restoration of Israel, the revival of Hebrew. This is a poem called Harry Webb, a poem called Israel. Listen, Wales. Here was a people whom even you could afford to despise, growing nothing, making nothing, belonging nowhere. A people whose sweat glands had atrophied and lived by their wits, who lived by playing the violin. A lot better, incidentally, than you ever played the harp. And because they were such a people, they went like lambs to the slaughter. But some survive. Yes, listen closer now, and these are the different people. They have switched off Mendelssohn and tuned in to Maccabeus. The mountains are red with their blood. The deserts are green with their seed. Listen, Wales. So, uh, you know, Welsh nationalism drawing inspiration from uh, the establishment of Israel. The revival of Welsh in the second half of the 19th century drew inspiration from the revival of Hebrew. We have old pattern courses in Wales. They were imported into Wales in the early 1970s. I know many people have been influenced in Welsh through, uh, through old pattern. So, so far, this seems like the story of the confluence of two related and in some ways complementary ambition, worldwide Zionism, evangelical Protestantism, exerting powerful leverage on the great power of the day, which was Great Britain. And it tells the story of how a community's consciousness of its minority status can impel it towards a productive solidarity with the Jewish people. But it wasn't all coverage. Anti-Semitism runs through the stream of Welsh Jewish historical relations too, like a dark undercurrent. And this is the second and shorter section of my talk. I mentioned earlier that it was there early on, these mentions, majority of references to Jewish people in early Welsh poetry. In the field of political rhetoric, we find Llewellyn ap Griffith, he was the last Prince of Wales. He was killed in battle in 1282, a couple of weeks before that, he was writing to the Archbishop of Canterbury, basically asking him to tell Edward I to leave them alone because they're a Christian nation. And he says, we've been persecuted by Edward I almost in the same way as the Saracens and the Jews. This is not solidarity, he's saying we are not individuals like the Saracens and Jews. That's actually a distancing class. So, you know, some 
patriotic Welsh people like to think of themselves as more civilised than the English. We don't invade other countries, we don't impose our language or religion on them. We oppress ourselves, we don't oppress others. This is a comforting, self-affirming myth. But it's flawed. I mentioned the Cardiff Jewess abduction case of 1867, where conversionism <coughs> became coercion. And worse, in 1911, during a time of industrial unrest, rioters looted Jewish businesses in some coal mining communities in South Wales. And I uh, should see the film Solomon and Gaynor, the 1999 Oscar nominated film is set against that background. It's, it's actually pretty accurate in its balance portrayal of it. And what happened after that is that both communities, Welsh, uh, British and Jewish, hushed this incident up. They didn't really want to make a big deal of it. But you know, we have to acknowledge this is the one instance of communal violence in the UK since the resettlement and it happened in Wales. And it was tied up with the British influences as well. So we see the dominant current of Welsh public opinion broadly sympathetic but this undercurrent of hostility. And this has affected some of Welsh literature's biggest names. There are not many of them, they're pre-Holocaust and they're exceptional, but they must be noted. And the earliest of them is actually the worst. Owen Morgan Edwards, uh, born 1858, died in 1920, one of the fathers of modern Welsh nationalism, revered Oxford academic, MP, chief inspector of schools, and in many ways, very, very warm character, heroic, naive, idealistic, warm-hearted, and generous, which makes it all the more painful to record this instance of anti-Semitism. That's the worst example in Welsh literature. He went on a tour of Europe in 1889 and produced a travel log called From Bala to Geneva. And he has an encounter with European Jewish communities. And he's moved to recall um, a story from Wales about how a local family had been ruined by the Jews. And as he puts it, a Jewish wolf falling on prey in the darkest hour. And he has this fantastic theory in which uh, Jewish people go around Welsh hill farms tempting farmers with, he actually says it, fine wines and jewels and, and, uh, and silks. And the idea of a Welsh hill farmer falling for fine wines and silks and, and jewels is of course absurd. But the idea is that they get into debt and then the Jewish person uh, distrains on their property and, and gets it. And he goes on, can one justify the hatred of the nations of the continent towards the Jews? I had thought a great deal before replying. Yes, without a doubt. Now he, uh, he actually quotes the Protocols of the Elders of Zion uncritically, and uh, he also goes on to say, uh, to cite religious reasons for his anti-Semitism, and says, what is the work of the Jew today? He is everything except what God intended as the beginning for him to be. Inscribing the holiness of the Lord on the bridles of the horse, sanctifying the world, teaching religion to the nations was their work, but their whole soul is directed towards making money. The Jew does not talk about holiness and religion. Perhaps he does not understand what they are anymore. It's about gold, jewelry, and gems and fine clothes. He was sent to proclaim another world. He sold his soul for this world. Now, I can't find any of this in, in any of Edwards' other work. And in later editions, uh, editors took this out completely. And elsewhere, the work actually uses Jewish material. I don't mean Old Testament material, I mean Jewish rabbinical teaching. He uses them for religious instruction. And yet he allowed himself, that's an extended passage, it goes on for page after page after page, with embellishments. And he, he allowed himself that. So, you know, that was there. Um, now, not the worst example of anti Semitism in Welsh public life, but the most notorious is that of Saunders Lewis. 1893-1985. He's the central figure of 20th century Welsh nationalism. Founder of the Welsh Nationalist Party, which is now in government with the Labour Party in Wales. And he was English born and bred, raised Welsh speaker, and was led to nationalism by his experience of the destruction of European civilization in the First World War. And he saw a return to a pre-modern, organic folk life as a protection against modern mass democratic society. And it sounds familiar to the incipient early fascism. And it had much in common with that, and it, um, 
It was not a totalitarian vision, but unfortunately it was an anti-Semitic vision. And he picked this up from neo-Catholic French writers, neo-Catholic English writers like T.S. Eliot and uh, G.K. Chesterton, and the Dead Ellen. And he put this into his work, and uh, you know, even as he went, he went on and, and he carried out the climactic act, or the catalytic act of 20th century Welsh nationalism, which was burning a British Air Force bombing school, which was set up in Wales in the 1930s, and they committed a symbolic act of arson there, gave themselves up to the police, and became kind of martyrs for the cause as a result. This was a catalytic event. But if you look at Lewis's own rhetoric at the time, why did he think a war was coming? A war was coming because of usury. And because that only means one thing, only means. He was thinking this was a Jewish conspiracy to make money by making war. So this act, which is revered among Welsh nationalists as a self-sacrificial non-violent to go act, is actually a dark about how to do. Lewis' own mind, he was, wasn't just fighting British militarism, behind that he was fighting Jewish capitalism and all that stuff. In his poems, we have a famous instant, instance from a 1939 poem called The Deluge, and he referred to the supposed role of New York Jewish financiers in causing the depression. Then, as the quote, then on Olympus in Wall Street, 1929, busy as their immortal scientific task of guiding the prophets of fate, the gods with their feet in the orbison carpets and their Hebrew noses in the quarters of statistics, decided that the time had come to make credit scarce through the universe of gold. That's translated from Welsh, but you know it's, it's the usual thing. He did it in other poems as well, and speeches and articles. Now, he did it into the uh, First World War, into the Second World War, initially doubted reports of the Holocaust as propaganda, later, of course, uh, realized how wrong he'd been, but never admitted it. Subsequent to the Second World War, he wrote a play called Esther, about the, the story of Esther, entirely sympathetic with Jewish interests. He wrote two plays about the von Stauffenberg plotters against Hitler and which they are the heroes and he comes from the village. This is a belated and oblique form of expiation but he never admitted to this anti-Semitic. I did a program, a television program on him uh, in 2002. I interviewed his daughter who was then in the 60s or 70s and she told me, oh no he wasn't anti-Semitic. Um, he told me, she said, uh, he couldn't be anti-Semitic because a Jewish doctor had saved his wife's life at her uh, in childbirth and consequently her life. And of course, I'm sure he said that, I'm sure he believed that, I'm sure she believes that, but of course, sadly, he did talk about that. But he's a major, major thing. And during the Second World War, he stood for Parliament and was opposed. He was, he was quite a right winger, he was opposed by a liberal called W. J. Griffith, who mocked his ideas of Catholicism and traditionalism coming from a left perspective. And he accused Saunders of being a fascist. Which is ironic, because Griffith in 1941 wrote the following, and he listed the threats to Wales, and here he said, North Wales, full of rich and crafty Jews. It's 1941. Full of the, and people he's talking about are refugees from bombing in northern English cities who fled to the countryside, along with many non-Jews, non but he singles them out. Full of rich and crafty Jews who lap up all the resources of the country and leave the poor natives deprived and helpless. And by the way, is it not time for someone to protest openly against these Jews who have become a burden on Fanditno, Colvin Bay, Abergella, and the surrounding countryside? Are the Jews completely unable to learn a lesson from the history of their nation in other countries? I had a conversation the other day with two or three of them, and I was shocked by their attitudes to the events around them. They do not yet realize that they have had any responsibility at all for their afflicted state as a people in the Nazi countries. It appears that they have two main aims, and two alone, escaping from every danger in every place, whatever the danger to other people, and carrying forward their old traditional manner of enriching themselves on the weaknesses of the Gentile. Anti-Semitism, you say? No. Just trying to give a word of warning in time to a nation which deserves the best the world can give it, but which is in real danger in this country, as in every other country, if they continue behave as they are. 
if they do not heed the warning, there will be a problem in Wales, as well as in England. And when a nation becomes a problem, it is vain for us to expect justice from the folk who suffer under the results of that problem. The sad thing is that an insignificant journal like the Tenor, that's the name of the magazine where he's writing this in one, in which, of which the world knows virtually nothing, is the only place a warning like this can appear. There's a simple reason for that. Very few papers, except the Welsh language papers, do not have the finger of the Jews in them, directly or otherwise. And this is the guy who called Songs Lewis the fascist. And that was later than Songs of Lewis's own thing, own literature. So, you can find anti semitism Semitism on the left and the right of the political spectrum throughout modern art history, even though public opinion was largely phylosophic. So these are attacking. I've looked for other examples. There are a few references in Welsh literature, the odd stereotypical fictional Jewish plutocrats here, the odd passing reference elsewhere, and I have come across casual anti-Semitism as well ever since I've identified with this subject comments and things. I was in the uh, political conference the other day, and uh, no, sorry, last, last autumn, a year ago, and I was sitting there minding my own business, and I heard uh, somebody discussing getting a drink from the bar and who was going to pay, and one of them remarked uh, cheerily, oh, all the Jews out in Jerusalem. Is that a supposed meanness? And that's 2006. So this casual old anti-Semitism. Now, anti-Semitism is found partners in all of them and it's taken justification from entirely contradictory public events, from the successes of the Jewish people, from their failures, their strengths, their weaknesses. So why um, I enumerate and pick just one more <coughs> culture which has been infected by this virus? Well, I hope there may be some use in showing how a community's intelligentsia can move in less than a century from an overwhelming philo-Semitism and public endorsement of Zionism, an endorsement it was prepared to back through costly military force, to a situation mainly of indifference, that's where strong public voices can be anti-Zionist and, in some cases, anti semitic So I want to look, in these last few minutes, at that new anti-Semitism. And again, I've come across aspects of this. I, I went to Israel in 2004 uh, as a guest of the Israeli Foreign Ministry and was subject to very public criticism for this. And some of the criticism of Israel, of course, as you're well aware, shades into anti-Semitism as well, as it does in Wales. So, these sentiments, Jew equals Israeli, equals the bone of contention, equals the enemy of the modern Welshman, long live the Welshman, the bugger of the Jew, they seem a long way from the sense of solidarity with which nationally minded Welsh, Welsh people regarded Zionism 19 years previously. I think there are, that kind of solidarity seems unimaginable today. I think there are three major factors which have influenced this change. I think the first is the disappearance of that community's ability to project its power on a world stage. For a brief period at the turn of the 20th century, when Wales was at the height of its industrial power, when its religious constituency was at its strongest, and when a patriotic Welshman was the British Prime Minister, and with a coterie of Welsh advisers, a kind of Celtic Camelot, Welsh national aspirations found themselves aligned with the centre of British power and with unique access to it. The later collapse of the Welsh industrial economy, the rapid decline of religion, and the, bre the breach in the personal connection with the power centre, and the subject subsequent divergence of Welsh and British interests pus pushed the Welsh intelligentsia into the earlier century of marginalisation and opposition. This has started a disengagement from the sobering responsibility of exercising power and taking the consequences of so doing, and to allow the growth instead of the intoxicating experience of advocating the use of power by others in the knowledge that such advocacy will have no consequences for the advocate. So, is it possible that impotence can provide a more fertile breeding ground for supremacy for anti-Semitism? Perhaps societies which feel powerless, marginalized, and threatened can be particularly susceptible to the infection of anti-Semitism. The second factor is the near disappearance of Christian religious observance in Wales as a whole, including among nationalists. Evangelical Protestantism, while occasionally in tension with Judaism in the past, as we've seen, nonetheless provided a widespread awareness of the Jewish people, of their sacred scriptures, and a firm theological underpinning of Gentile Jewish sympathy. The enfeeblement of that evangelical Protestantism has created ignorance, 
and alienation, which again can allow prejudices to flourish. And thirdly, and finally, there is the change in perception of the Jewish people from oppressed to oppressors, causing elements, and only elements, not all in their elements, but elements in the nationalistic Welsh intelligentsia, which derives much of its sense of self-esteem from its identification with the underdog to shift its sympathies. Now, by no means all nationalists are automatically anti-Israel. The anti-Israel voices, however, are often dominant. At worst, I suspect there's a desire to feel affirmed through righteous grievance, a habit which has grown through long disenfranchisement, has become detached from its original object, which is the now largely resolved dispute between Wales and England, and is now using the Arab-Israel conflict as a kind of pornography for the conscience, gratifying the desire for righteous indignation while not requiring involvement or commitment. Now it's tempting to look for comparisons with the current situation and wonder if a similar complex of secularization, impaired capacity to project power, and shifting sympathies might foster the further growth of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism in the West generally. I'll stop short of drawing any such definite conclusions or from offering any predictions. I think history is too unpredictable for that. But I hope that this, what we've studied, has provided us with some food for thought. So I'll summarize by saying that in the case of this community, a strain of latent anti-Semitism contracted time out of mind from original European Christian prejudice against the Jewish people, had long been held in check by the antibodies of enlightened evangelical Protestantism and by a consciousness of the responsibilities of power. But the removal of those antibodies, the debilitation of that society's influence and sense of responsibility to political marginalization and cultural decay has allowed the virus to grow again in a new mutation. And this has created a disorder in which that society's long inculcated habit of deriving self-esteem from identifying with the righteous grievance of the oppressed has, with the resolution of the main cause of its own oppression, found in anti-Israel sentiments shading sometimes into anti-Semitism an all too easy path to continue gratification. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, we have some time for questions and answers, and I would like to take uh, the opportunity to start off. That's okay. I have two quick questions. The first one is more of a point of clarification. You spoke uh, in depth about how the, the Welsh were identified with the liberation of Israel during the first period of the First World War, and that a lot of Welsh troops participated in the, in the exercise and gave their lives to remove the Turkish from the so my question is, what happened between that period and the period in the 1930s and 40s when Jewish refugees were escaping from Europe and were arriving in Palestine and British troops, in many cases, escorted them back to Europe to serve death or brought them to Cyprus and in some cases literally shot from this, from Haifa into the refugee ships arriving on the shore. So what, what happened between the period of Welsh identifying with sort of a biblical notion of uh, liberating Israel and then this period of time? I think the, the answer to that is that it was too complicated for the Welsh public to get a handle on it. I think that's what that, that troubled period, mandate period uh, where, of course, you know, the riots and the two competing communities, the British trying to keep them apart, it didn't register so highly in the in, in public it wasn't a clear-cut conflict. And the idea of a, a crusade you know, this acquiring Palestine was a, in the First World War was a prestige objective. And of what military value it was, I'm not so sure, but it was a prestige objective. And it was a huge symbolic value. And it was easy to understand, but it was the man, and consequently it, it, it produced visual images and, 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 and tied into an, a nice narrative with the beginning of the conquest. And, and then, the messy aftermath, I don't think, registered to the same degree. Also, the uh, sadly, foreign wars only register at home when there are large-scale domestic, large-scale casualties, and there were not national casualties. It was a, a drip, drip of casualties like there were in many British colonies at the time. And it didn't register highly enough for it to produce much of a blip in in health public opinion. Uh, it focused again during the. Um, the United Nations books 
but then mainly among nationalist United people who wanted who wanted to have it. And the dwindling but still fervent evangelical community who wanted it for religious people. So, so this sort of brings me to the second part of the question, which is how to what extent is, when you were speaking of philo Semitism and anti Semitism, I was also imagining notions of uh, Lawrence of Arabia and sort of British notions of otherness, of Orientalism, the Islamic Arab, which was also sort of competing at the same moment. So to what extent is this whole process of um, relating to the Jew a part of empire building, uh, expanding empire, maintaining dominance over certain parts of the world, and reaching out in a sense to, to identify what to change, to is this part of the empire of building or in the reality of the moment? or? I think at that stage it was empire maintaining. And I think you're absolutely right. It was, it was and I think Lloyd George uh, uh, indicates that. He, he goes into this great peroration about admiration and identification and mutual respect, etc., 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 etc. And he wanted your help. Is the last line. That's, and that, that is the bottom line, literally the bottom line. They wanted Jewish influence and help. In the First World War effort, they thought it would help uh, influence uh, Russia to keep Russia in the war. They thought it would keep America, bring America in and keep America in the war and, and so on. So uh, that's what he thought he'd get out of uh, uh, giving some design. Yes, it was absolutely part of the imperial project. It wasn't altruistic. But it pulled in altruistic energies into it. But it wasn't purely altruistic. The Orientalism, uh, and uh, this is the idea that at exactly the same time they were sponsoring Lawrence in the competing project in the same time and telling him to tell the Arabs that they can have their freedom, just get rid of the tools. And we'll sort it all out after the summer. And they were competing. Uh, project, uh, Lawrence, I, I got a passage from Lawrence, was born in Wales. Uh, and if you, ever, if you ever find stuff in the Northwest world, I've taken Jewish visitors there occasionally and showed them where Lloyd George is buried and uh, his childhood home where he's buried and where Lawrence of Arabia was born. They're within about three miles of one another. You can do the whole of Middle East history in three miles. And uh, Lawrence was, a, was Welsh born, uh, had a, a distant identification with Wales, was openly skeptical about Zionism during the First World War. And of course, Sponsored British interests for an entirely competing project, the, the consequences of which are still in. Uh, what does the uh, Welsh intelligentsia currently make of the Muslim immigration into Great Britain? Right. Now, that's interesting. Now, with, uh, this, I'm, when I say the Welsh intelligentsia, I, I mean that, that primitive nationalist, if you mind it, minority of a minority, but still the ones who will tend to be custodians of cultural vehicles and journals and, and so on. The cultural, many of them are disproportionately influ influential as cultural gatekeepers. Now, this, is, this is an interesting and troubling question. In fact, I'm, my next book is going to be Wales and the Muslims. I'm just getting involved with it now. I don't know a great deal about it, but what I've seen so far has been uh, generally a visceral reluctance to side with any opposition to this Muslim interests. And, and that comes from a lot of complicated habits of not being nasty to minorities of any kind, and also not doing anything that the British state wants to do. So whether that is standing up for God save the Queen, or joining the British armed forces, or being, separate, or being cautious about Muslim immigration and possible radicalisation, then that strand of oppositional thinking will instinctively run counter to it and consequently not be part of immigration or radicalization for, I suspect, those pretty negative reasons. Although there have been exceptions, and I know of at least three uh, influential cultural commentators within that community who have uh, been skeptical and uh, by no means antagonistic, but certainly openly skeptical, and who have criticised that very tendency in the news. So I'm not a lone voice in, in, in arguing for a, a more nuanced approach either to the Jewish people or to the Muslims. There are uh, other people doing the same thing as well. 
to mention before that uh, the population of Wales was approximately 3 million, approximately how many Jewish people? At the height of the Jewish community, uh, as I said, there were small Sephardi mercantile communities from the 18th century on, which grew very slowly. Then the great wave of emigration in the late 19th century, for all the reasons we you know, uh, a part of that washed into Wales. And by 1914, which was the height of the Welsh industrial power, there were 6,000 Jewish people in Wales, maximum. And they started moving out almost as soon as they reached that that point because the coal industry started to decline. And, and this is the strange thing. Since I've done this work, you know, people ask me, well, what are you working on? You've got a book about Wales and the, the Jews. I say, ah, there used to be a lot of Jews in, insert name of town, left when the money went. They said, mm -hmm. I said, yes. I said, so did most of the people. <laughs> <laughs> But of course, the uh, Jewish mobility seems to be uniquely uh, sinister, doesn't it? Certain so yeah, they, they moved out and emigrated from the industrial districts to the coastal cities, and increasingly from there to London and across to Israel. And now there's a thousand Welsh, a thousand Jewish people connected with the community, and according to the census, a further thousand people who must be of Jewish descent. My father lived in Wales from 1900 to 1917 in Port Talbot, up before he emigrated to the U.S. And I wondered about communication between the Welsh and the Jews. So I read a very interesting article today called How Greeners Come to the Valley by Michael Wallach. And in this article, I need a clarification from you. He says, what, clear, what emerged clearly from my talk with Welsh Jews is that while they are grateful to the country that welcomed them and are friendly with their non-Jewish neighbors, they will never be able to sing, and I can't pronounce the Welsh, the Welsh National Anthem with true Welsh fervor. As one of the Welsh-speaking Jews told me half in jest, to be a real Welshman, you must be chapel. Now what does this signify? Okay, well this, um, the chapel church divide is largely a Gentile game in, in, in Wales, entirely Gentile game, but, but it's, um, it stems from the, the, the fact that the Anglican Church in, in Britain as a whole was traditionally identified with the ruling class, with the landowners, with the royal family, it was, it was the state established church, it had all the privileges of that, including its own taxation system, which people had to pay to, and it also had all the abuses that went with that, you know, ignorance and corruption and so on. Uh, this was felt particularly by those people who were Puritans and who couldn't get along with that kind of system. And of course, you know, the Puritans came here, didn't they, in, in large numbers, uh, or many of them did. So that, they were people who had dissented from the, the Anglican Church. In, in Wales, the, the rupture between people who dissented from Anglicanism was made much stronger by the fact that Anglicanism was identified with an English-speaking ruling class and dissent, non-conformity, and the chapel was really became increasingly the religion of the ordinary Welsh-speaking common people of Wales. So the rupture took on an extra dimension of an extra ethnic and linguistic dimension. And that became numerically and demographically by far the dominant proportion of Welsh Christianity chapel is much, much stronger in Wales than church, church being Anglican. And that it tended then to put its stamp on secular Welsh culture as well, including its nationalism and its music and so on. And Anglicanism within Wales was marginalised as being a, uh, a kind of uh, Englishman's religion. And uh, I'm actually a church man myself rather than the chapel goer, so I, I'm, uh, uh, I'm in that, that side of the divide. And in fact, non-conformity was sufficiently strong politically by 1914 to force through a bill disestablishing the church in Wales. So Wales doesn't have a state church. England does. The Anglican Church, the Church of England, is the state religion. In Scotland, the Presbyterian Church is the established state religion. Wales doesn't have a state religion. 
and it has an Anglican church, but it's not an established church. It's just a denomination like any other. It sometimes behaves as if it's still the uh, established church, but it, it is well, the non-conformity was strong enough to actually force it to be disestablished against its will. I think so. So that's what he means really, is that uh, Welsh nationalism tends to uh, have a religious uh, element to it, and that element tends to be non-conformist, Presbyterian, Baptist, etc. Thank you. Oh, yes, sorry, sorry. I imagine that you get a good variety of responses when you present your argument in Wales and England. Can you characterize some of these responses? Yes. Uh, I I think the strangest response was when I did this uh, talk. So I, I've not done an anti uh, an anti-Semitic talk before. But I, I've done a survey of the whole field. I did it to a group in Mid Wales of Messianic Jewish believers and Jews of Jesus, and their more numerous Christian supporters. And I'm not a conversionist at all. At all. But uh, I went there to give them a historical lecture, you know, give them And I got to the first quotes, one of those prayers about, you know, convert, and they all started shouting, Amen, Hallelujah. And, uh, <laughs> and every time I came to uh, uh, one of these quotes, and there were more in that lecture than in this, they, they, they started kind of shouting, Yeah, praise the Lord, Amen, Hallelujah. And, was, and I thought, God, I'm giving me a historical lecture, and, I'm, and, I'm, and they're hearing a sermon. <laughs> so that, that was strange. Now, now, that kind of conversion and that kind of is uh, very, very small uh, constituency indeed. So that's not common. Uh, I, I found, um, well, I found, well, Jewish audiences in Wales generally stop me halfway through and say, um, he was my uncle, but I get to uh, various Jewish writers and I say, oh, I knew, I knew him. So, he was my uncle, so I get you know much more involvement in that in that sense. and and. Uh, and also, I, I, I found people surprised at how weak Christianity is in Wales currently, because Wales is historically much more religious than England, and that graph has fallen with spectacular speed during the 20th century in Wales, um, on almost to vanishing point. You could probably you could put a date on its vanishing point, the way, the way it's going. So I, I found people surprised by that, because the cultural expectations of the Welsh people are more religious than English people. But it's no longer true. So I found people surprised by that. Now, now about that, and that's one of the reasons for the, this, the, the rise in modern anti-Semitism. Why is there this decline in Christianity in in Wales, and what is it being replaced by, if anything? And just quickly. You, would you predict that if this happens, the same decline happens in other countries, let's say Ireland, would this would it have the same result? And and also, I just want to put it after that. What is the uh, is is a similar situation going on now in Ireland? Is there anti much anti-Semitism in Ireland? I'm afraid I don't know about that. Okay. I don't think there's a, uh, that big a, uh, a Jewish community there historically, yeah. and. I seem to remember Hitler's plan for the invasion of Britain where they'd enumerated the number of Jews in different places. I think there were 3,000 in Ireland and they'd be even enumerated those. Mm -hmm. in so I don't think it was very large then. There would be yeah. more in Wales then. So I, I don't know about okay. Irish But well, as far as the first part of my question, what is it being replaced by Christianity? Uh, I, I, well, why, why is it disappearing? Like I, I think there are various factors. And I, I think it's... it's it, Gosh, what, why is it declining? I think it's still going through a cycle of response to <coughs> science in the modern world. Generally, I think I think Christianity in Wales is still has has not. I and mean, I mean, Britain generally has not come up with a convincing response to the claims of science as opposed to religion. And in, here in the U.S., it's different. It's held it's held up against that. It's, it's, mutated and, and, and adapted. And I think in outside theological circles and general culture, I, I think it, it feels like a failed metaphor generally. It feels like a failed worldview to most British people. And coupled with that, what's it been replaced by? On fringes with uh, spirituality, New Age 
spirituality, that, that kind of thing. Um, and mainly by consumerism. Which is consumerism. Entirely uh, self-sufficient, fulfilling, <coughs> way of life and world worldview, which can take you from the cradle to the grave without knowing, knowing anything about uh, Christianity. I, I had a young lady with your work experience recently, and I needed to send her an email. I, I asked for her first name, she told me. And, uh, and your second name, Jordan. She said, oh, like the river. It's a long thought. Oh, yes, I suppose so. I said, there's nobody ever said, like the river. She said, no. Am I supposed to say, like the supermodel? Yes. <laughs> and and I, what, what, what can I say? This, this, this lady, you know, 20 years graduate, educated, you can go through cradle to the grave and not know River Jordan or you know, anything like that. And, and that, that, that is sadly what it's like. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I can tell you the figures, Wales, 12% of the people go to church at least once a month. In Northern Ireland, it's 45%. Mm -hmm. How long that will last, I don't know, because there's a big political component in that in church. Mm -hmm. In England, it is higher than Wales, it's 14, not much. Scotland, it's 18. So th th those are people going at least once a month. Mm -hmm. And this is a fairly minimal measure of uh, The interesting thing is that in London, if you take London separately, it's 25%. Mm -hmm. London is actually more religious single part of the UK. A lot of that is uh, uh, immigration, immigration from West Africa and the Caribbean. So London is actually more religious than anywhere else. The most modern, most you know, technically secular places. But yeah, I think that's that's best answer I can give. It seems to be going through the cycle. It hasn't reached bottom yet. It's still dying. So would you predict that something similar could happen in other countries then? Else. I, I would say that I don't, I don't know enough about other countries to, to speculate. I, I only know really well from the UK well enough. I, I, I couldn't extrapolate confidently. Mm -hmm. uh, so, oh yes. Um, I'm just wondering if there are if there have been other oppressed uh, minorities apart from the Jews that Wales culturally. Um, in the minds of its people has related to the way it had related to the Jews. Right. Um, the only uh, the only major one, uh, I think, historically, has been the Irish, <laughs> who came over in very large numbers from the family, because we were the, we were the nearest country. I mean, lots of Irish people came here, of course. Uh, but we were the nearest country, so we had lots of Irish people, family refugees. And in the mid-19th century, that caused huge um, issues in, in public policy and you know street fights and riots and deep deep antagonism because they, they were Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, they were English or Irish speaking about the Welsh people. So and they were they were for less money. And so there were big, big tensions over that which are now entirely from uh, you, you know you'd have to remind even some of your Irish ancestry in Wales of those facts. But they were entirely from. But that was the biggest one and in its day it was a very big deal. But it, it, it didn't have the, uh, the deep ideological involvement which the Jewish involvement did. And there haven't been other minorities historically with the same numerical or symbolic or political influence. So, uh, yeah. Oh, yes. What about. The whole involvement of the Welsh people in African slavery and African slavery, that the abolition movements often borrowed from the, the, the idea of redeeming Israel and the kind of the tough people that were oppressed and so on. Did that vocabulary bring self in chapel and uh, abolitionists and so on? Yes, but, well, uh, Welsh uh, people, there was a strong abolitionist movement in Wales, but the interesting thing is that Welsh. Uh, America, and because there were very, very many Welsh speakers in America, at least 4,000 Welsh speakers took part in the American Civil War, all expelled with them on the northern side. Mm -hmm. You could put part of the settlement by them, even though people like Jefferson did, where the Welsh ancestors were distant about that. Um, Welsh American public opinion, which was strong, vigorous, had its uh, many journals published in North America in Welsh, 
uh, Welsh public opinion in North America during that period was overwhelmingly and almost entirely abolitionist, with, without any dissent or voices at all within Welsh America. Uh, in Wales, ironically at the time, it was less abolitionist. Welsh public opinion at the time was more sceptical towards that abolition, and in some cases by some professors slavery. Not much to the south, but the, the main <coughs> difference really was between Welsh America, which was entirely on side of abolition, and domestic Welsh opinion, which was more, in some ways, I suppose, identified with, with British interests, which of course sat on the fence for the long run, then, regarding the nation. Uh, despite the unification of Europe, let's say, in the European Union, there seems to be, a, on the other hand, a counterweight of many small linguistic minorities, etc., like the Welsh and the Latvians or others, are trying to uh, assert themselves. Now, uh, how does this play out in terms of Israel, Jews versus Arab or Palestinians? Do they have any solidarity with the, the Jewish nation as a, as a small linguistic group? Do, do they have? Um, again, I'm afraid I don't know how it plays out. But I do recall during the Northern Ireland uh, troubles that um, which are very recently resolved was it, 700 years in the, 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 the I remember that each party picked a side in the Arab Israeli conflict as a proxy for their own side. So the uh, the Protestants would put up Israel flags alongside the Union Jack as seeing themselves as uh, true believers surrounded by mm. infidels. And in response, the uh, Republicans identified with Palestine, with the Palestinian flag. Like, so there's a classic case of a proxy conflict going on. I don't know how the implications. Well, well, just as a follow up on that, yeah. or a response to that also, I'm thinking of how in recent years the Roman Catholic Church officially has rebuked you know, anti Semitism and the Pope has made all kinds of statements that we are spiritual Semites and all this, and yet you find the Catholic Republicans taking the Palestinian side, so it's not that, it's much more complicated. It is complicated, yes. yes. There's an awful lot of grain areas, and I hope I haven't given too simplistic an impression here, of course, it's a, uh, the situation is, is quite nuanced, and I, I wouldn't want to, to give the impression that it is simplistic. I'm just interested as to how the same impulse, this impulse of solidarity with the oppressed can shift sides in the course of quite, uh, quite a short historical period, and from intense identification to that. But, I'm not talking the, the entire population being so or the entire intelligence the elements within it. But for the same reasons, coming to a different response within a matter of well a lifetime. Okay. So first of all on behalf of uh, USA, thank you very much for a very rich and uh new one. And also for people here, some some of Graham's books are available for purchase but just over there. And yeah, everybody. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.